to everybody here and out there. Um, welcome to the Washington Institute. Uh, what I'm going to do is uh, start off by asking each of our panelists uh, to give uh, six or seven minutes worth of their thoughts on uh, the issues that we're going to uh, be asked to discuss. Uh, I will then uh, uh, create a discussion uh, between the panelists. Uh, so I'm looking for uh, divergent views, and if not, I will fabricate some. Uh, and then uh, I'll open it uh, to you uh, in the room uh, for your uh, thoughts as well. Uh, Suzanne, uh, the floor is yours. Great. Thanks so much, and thanks so much to the Washington Institute for organizing this discussion today. I'm, uh, really honored to be uh, with these two gentlemen. And as I said to someone uh, before I stepped up here, it's one of the few panels where I can't simply look at Mike Singh's Twitter feed and uh, try to come up with the smartest thing to say, because he's going to say it. Um, but let me just uh, perhaps provide a little context uh, that you're probably familiar with, but I think it's important uh, to assessing where we go from here. Um, the first point I want to make is just uh, that this is what we're seeing today, what we've seen over the course of the past four months is really the predictable consequence of the maximum pressure policy that the Trump administration has adopted. Um, when uh, the president began to uh, speak publicly and move uh, more forcefully toward exiting from the joint comprehensive plan of action, really from his earliest days in office, culminating in the decision and the announcement in May of 2018, um, there were uh, widely held cataclysmic predictions uh, of what might come in response to that move from the Iranians. Uh, and what we saw, in fact, was uh, a year of relative restraint on the part of the Iranians. Uh, I don't think that that was accidental. Um, I think it reflected uh, the calculation on the part of the system that uh, they wanted to wait and see how the maximum pressure policy would play out, how the Europeans would react. Um, to what extent investors and firms would in fact abide by American sanctions applied unilaterally rather than in concert with the rest of the international community, as was the case during both uh, the Bush and Obama administrations. And what they found, of course, was that uh, in fact American sanctions uh, without support and in fact with the active opposition in some cases of all of our partners in the your nuclear diplomacy with Iran, that maximum pressure was incredibly effective. Um, it had a, an immediate impact on the Iranian economy in a way that was felt by ordinary Iranians um, much more strenuously than the traditional trade sanctions, the financial measures uh, have had a, a catastrophic impact on the value of Iran's currency on the flows of foreign investment and even uh, trade of licit goods, as you've all probably heard and read. Uh, Iranians have difficulty accessing uh, supplies of, of both food and uh, medical supplies and pharmaceuticals, uh, all of which are, in fact, exempted from all U.S. sanctions. Uh, but the, the financial mechanisms that have been put in place um, that have really been perfected over the course of the past 13 years since Bank Sadrat was first uh, designated by the uh, Bush administration. These measures have proven um, very effective and uh, have offered little recourse uh, for the rest of the international community to compensate the Iranians. Uh, what the Iranians, I think, have calculated um, since May of this year is that they simply couldn't withstand uh, an indefinite application of maximum pressure. Uh, and that they needed to change both the calculus of the Trump administration and uh, inject urgency around this issue for the broader international community. Uh, they didn't have a terribly good set of options. Um, you know, they had waited, they had watched, they had tried to access uh, alternative financial vehicles, uh, and in fact, none of that proved uh, very effective. And so what they did was obviously turn to uh, a, an approach which has served them well, which is in effect, the kind of standard Iranian playbook, when you're hit, punch back, and punch back harder. Um, and so that's what we're seeing. Um, the second point I wanted to make is that this escalation that we've seen really since June of this year in the aftermath of the Trump administration's decision to go to zero um, is paying off for the Iranians. Um, there's obviously been a lot of uh, headlines, uh, a lot of concern expressed. The Trump administration um, took the extraordinary step of sanctioning the central bank, which would be less, more extraordinary if, in fact, the central bank weren't already sanctioned. 
um, so it had relatively little effect. Um, and what the Iranians have experienced over the course of the past uh, four to five months since they began this process of escalation is uh, a greater receptivity on the part of the international community to try to address the financial issues that they're facing, the economic constraints that they're facing, um, the sense that, in fact, the, the Trump administration is at least in part to blame for this set of circumstances has made at least some of our allies hesitate in terms of the way that they've been prepared to support the Trump administration. There was an important statement issued this week by the three European part parties to the deal, um, which came a little closer to uh, backing up the, the U.S. position. But throughout this crisis and, and as the cost has begun to multiply for the international community, uh, the, what we've heard from Europeans is, yes, but, yes, what the Iranians are doing is uh, completely unacceptable, but you, the United States, uh, have to find ways to redress this through your own policies. Um, and so, in effect, the Iranians have greater standing at this stage in the international community than they would have had uh, any of this been undertaken while the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action was uh, fully supported by the United States. Uh, it's notable that, of course, the French offer for a $15 billion credit line came in the wake of attacks rather than before attacks, um, and that the Iranians had their first ever post-revolutionary meeting with a German chancellor this week with Chancellor Merkel. Uh, and President Rouhani. That was an unprecedented step. And while uh, there were obvious messages of displeasure um, with the attacks on Abqaiq and uh, Khreis uh, fields in Saudi Arabia, there was also, I think, the, the sort of um, legitimacy that was conferred upon the Iranian leadership uh, as a result of that kind of a meeting. So my anticipation is that we're going to see more of the same. Um, and it's going to be a constantly changing playbook. Uh, just yesterday, the Iranians, it was revealed that the Iranians are beginning to install uh, higher efficiency centrifuges uh, in another small incremental and ultimately still reversible violation of their own obligations under the JCPOA. I think that's exactly the kind of um, uh, creative approach to the international pressure that they're facing that we're going to see. One week it will be an attack on an oil installation, the next week it will be a small step away from the nuclear agreement, and it's going to be difficult to anticipate which way to move, and it's going to be difficult to respond because their tactics are going to be changing. Um, there have been, there's obviously new energy around diplomacy, and that's a, a net positive, but I think what we can interpret from both the experience of the Japanese Prime Minister who went to Tehran at the behest of President Trump uh, in June uh, only to find uh, while he was sitting there uh, a, a Japanese-owned small tanker uh, was hit by what is presumed to be Iranian saboteurs. Uh, and uh, the experience of, of the French uh, with their own offer is that the Iranians are unsatisfied with the, the sort of proposals they've received to date. Um, from the Iranian point of view, in fact, these are insufficient. The sanctions are illegitimate. Uh, and what they want is not just an extension of credit from the French, from a European power, to which they would ultimately then be, would be contingent upon an American uh, uh, sanctions waiver, and it would be contingent upon, obviously, tr that trade with, with Europe. What they want is free access to the international financial system. And my sense is that they're going to continue to push until they see something that looks a lot more like what they had up until May 2018, rather than uh, you know sort of these half measures and, and modest proposals. So where does that leave the United States? Um, obviously, we have, uh, I think, clearly lost any uh, significant deterrent impact on the Iranians. And I think un until and unless we impose some costs on Tehran for the series of actions that have been undertaken in direct response to American policy, that's going to continue. Um, but I think it has to be put uh, in, in the context of a framework for diplomacy. This, this administration has been very effective at applying financial vehicles to create pain for the Iranian economy. But what it has yet to do is demonstrate that it can change the calculus of the Iranian leadership. Um, there, there's going to have to be a diplomatic uh, vehicle, and it can't simply be the sort of uh, you know stratospheric 12 points of the Pompeo speech from the Heritage Foundation. It has to be a serious uh, framework that actually lays out 
a set of issues, a set of negotiations, a set of actors. What does the administration envision? Is it a reconstitution of the P5 plus one process? Is it something broader that in fact incorporates some of the Gulf states? We need to have something like that on the table if we are going to be serious about uh, building on the traction that I think has been generated at least in part because of the rising stakes around this conflict. Uh, the last point I wanted to make is simply that uh, I think what we're seeing uh, goes well beyond the immediate threat of Iran. I think we're seeing a shift in uh, the U.S. approach to the Gulf, uh, the U.S. approach to the broader regional security questions that is fundamental and is still very much unresolved. But the signals that have been sent to all of our traditional security partners in the Gulf as a result of the hesitancy of the Trump administration to react, uh, I think, are going to be long-lasting in their impact. Because for at least 40 and probably for actually 50 years, we have uh, from Washington articulated a commitment to ensuring the free flow of oil from the Gulf to protecting our regional security interests, uh, both through local partners as well as increasingly since the 1980s through our own military presence in the region and our own willingness to, to come in it, not simply to provide Patriot batteries, but in fact to, to, uh, to put boots on the ground in order to uh, resolve crises. And that has come time and time again. And clearly for a variety of different reasons, uh, the changing energy market dynamics, uh, the perception both that the United States is no longer dependent on Gulf oil supplies, as well as the increasing uh, awareness of uh, the climate emergency and the need to sh begin shifting more uh, seriously toward alternative energy supplies makes the concept of a war to defend oil supplies, as I think we, the President, the first President Bush uh, uh, powerfully mobilized in 1990 and 1991 uh, is not conceivable for the American public any longer. Um, that combined with the uh, rising dissatisfaction among the American uh, public with the costs of our forever wars, as well as the uh, what I think is a permanent shift in the way the American people uh, understand our relationship with Saudi Arabia as a result of a series of events that culminated uh, last year with the death, uh, the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. Um, all of these things mean that we no longer can operate and we no longer can uh, presume the same sort of an American commitment to the Gulf. Our partners are seeing that play out in real time. We have to start thinking about and articulating and making good on a new security doctrine for the Middle East and for the Gulf in particular that is viable, that has the support of the American political establishment as well as the American people. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Norm. The floor is yours. Well, good morning, and uh, also allow me to thank you for the opportunity to speak today uh, in such an august panel uh, at such an important location uh, and in, fr in front of such an interesting audience. Um, I'd like to, uh, I think broadly I, I share Susan's views. I have some different perspectives, but that doesn't mean disagreement per se. I'd just like to run through a handful of, uh, of points. Um, the U.S. and regional response has been fairly predictable. Um, um, it's been measured. The U.S. is attempting to build a coalition from reluctant allies. We're not the only country that doesn't want to be involved in a conflict in the region. Certainly the Saudis, the Emiratis, the Kuwaitis, the Bahrainis have no interest in a conflict in the region. And their ability to crystal ball what comes after a punitive strike on Iran is no better nor worse than ours. And they have the same divergent voices and opinions in their senior leadership that we would have in our own. Uh, and for this reason, I'm, there, are, there are no surprises as to what's happening. In many ways, President Trump has followed the policies of President Obama and President Bush. I saw these firsthand. Uh, provide defensive weapons to your allies, avoid a conflict in the region, try to build a coalition among always unenthusiastic allies, try to uh, work with Europe. And Europe is an important partner, but it's not always a relevant partner. You know, to be relevant, the, the, the line is you have to be relevant. And right now, Europe can neither stop U.S. sanctions nor can it stop U.S. actions. It has a one-note song, which is return to JCPOA. Um, and, and the ability for Europe to exert pressure on Iran itself is, uh, is, is, is limited to its desire to return to JCPOA and to offer financial solutions. Um, we have been reassuring our regional allies. In the last week, there was intense diplomacy in New York. I saw some of this up close. Um, the region is fairly comfortable with the U.S. response, but worried about where we're going to go in the future if things heat up. 
Uh, certainly there, there are those who are disappointed we didn't strike. And candidly, I would say mo very few of those people have the title president, emir, or king in their name and don't have to deal with the second day consequences. The second comment I would make is we have plenty of options. One thing that I'm usually disappointed with, um, <clears throat> it would be amusing were it not so serious, is uh, the number of articles or statements that begin with, after a strike, full-blown end of the world war breaks out. Countries rarely behave that way, um, um, uh, certainly since the First World War. Um, and you have, within Iran and the various players, a calculating and careful uh, set of partners. Iran does not seek a conflict which um, it would come at a time when it is has undergoing enormous fragilities and uh, a leadership transition. Um, the question becomes how to stop this from happening again tomorrow. And I concur with Susan. Iran's playbook is uh, fairly basic. Uh, and they know we can't defend every part of the wall at once. They will produce a series of short, sharp attacks meant to escalate world uh, uh, oil and commodity prices in order to force a variety of international states to pressure the Trump administration to lighten up on sanctions. The Trump administration, whatever your views are in the administration, has been rather consistent in its position on the JCPOA and Iran. I saw this from the inside of the administration, and I've served, I'm apolitical, I've served with Democrats Republicans, um, and they've remained in it. They're not going to lift sanctions um, until Iran changes its behavior. The 12 points that Susan mentioned are indeed stiff. They were also the world's policy to include international policy of the United States and international powers for decades. There's nothing we're asking of Iran that we didn't ask uh, until five minutes before the joint uh, uh, the JCPOA nuclear deal. Uh, we have a former congressman, honored to have him in the presence in the room, and routinely this was something that Congress insisted we stick with until JCPOA. What I think has happened, what I think is going to cloud what goes forward is we no longer have a bipartisan approach to Iran, and some of our fundamental drivers, in addition to energy, have changed. There are 80,000 American men, women, and children in Saudi Arabia. Iranian missiles do not turn left and right over the heads of Americans. You really have to think about that out loud and wonder why there aren't more people in the United States or in France for their own nationals or in whatever country it might be pushing back on Iran for firing missiles that directly threaten their nationals. As many of you know, the intelligence community's primary goal is force protection, keeping Americans alive, et cetera, et cetera. And the number one issue in my mind is how to keep Americans alive in places in the Middle East. And Iranian missiles may kill Americans tomorrow. We actually have a situation in Congress where Congress, for because of the Yemen war tragedy, is actually denying the Saudis openly or seeking to deny the intelligence that would enable them to find missiles on the ground as part of a broader intelligence denial to, to, to shorten the war. That is unprecedented. We no longer have a bipartisan approach as to what matters in the Middle East, and it goes beyond energy. The Iranian attacks in Yemen are certainly important for oil, but they're also important for global trade that goes to the Red Sea and the Bab el-Mandab. 12% of the world's rice supply goes to the Bab el-Mandab. Most of Southern European econ economies are hostage to what happens in the Bab el-Mandab. There's relative silence on this issue, and it's, it's inexplicable, so it goes more broadly beyond oil or just the region. The concept of deterrence may be the greatest victim of the last decade or two. This is nothing that's happened new in the Trump administration. Hundreds of Americans died in the Iraq conflict. We didn't have a response, and thousands were wounded. And we rarely mention the wounded who still live among us who, who were seriously wounded by Iranian missiles. There is no doubt, there has never been any doubt of in the earliest days that Iran has been responsible for all these actions. I can give you a litany of, these are, these are state crimes. These are acts of war to our own people. But since, the early, er, since the, the Iraq war, Iran has paid, or the people behind these have paid no price. And in Iran, I could give a list of issues ranging from the, the multiple terrorist attacks that have been compromised in Europe. And you must look at those terrorist attacks, attacks on Americans, attacks on Abqaiq, attacks in the, um, um, in, through Yemen, and say, if you were in Iran, why wouldn't you do this again? I think more broadly, outside the subject of today's brief, if you are Kim Jong-un and you decide, then you watch how the world responds to a cake, why don't you fire missiles on Japan? Will the world respond differently? I don't know. But I think other actors are watching this. And again, this is, we've become a very non, we very, very partisan world in the United States on uh, Saudi Arabia. 
on the Gulf and on Iran. And I, the Iranians read our newspapers. They watch our politics. Um, Javed Zarif who, uh, um, and President Rouhani, who exert practically no influence over national security issues on the topics we're talking today, I mean, practically no influence, um, um, are routinely received in, in the West. Um, I'll close with two other comments. It's often asked, is maximum pressure working or failing? Uh, I think you have to look at this two ways. First, um, Susan is correct. What is happening today is, is, is an inevitable result of what's happening with maximum pressure. Can anyone in the room say that it wouldn't have happened, this is inevitable if you wish to push Iran back in the region? So you can only, Iran seeks three things from JCPOA. There are three sanctions that count. Protection of oil exports, protection of repatriation of all export revenues, and access to international financial systems, primarily in Europe but also in Asia. The other sanctions are important and, and, and supportive, but this isn't what drives Iran's leadership. You cannot, you cannot move Iran's leadership without doing so. And when we talk about diplomacy, as I was remarking earlier, diplomacy means negotiations, right? We've got it. Negotiations mean win-win solutions, right? Okay, got it. So what are you willing to give up uh, to, uh, regarding Israel's security on Hezbollah and Syria? What are you willing to give up on Iran's presence in Yemen? We have a situation where we talk about negotiations between the Trump administration or the West, but what we're willing to give up comes at the price of those who live in the region, as much as an ICBM program which would threaten the United States, et cetera, et cetera. Maximum pressure is working in the sense that this is how you would expect Iran to respond. Iran would respond with strident rhetoric, respond with strident actions. They would do this if they were failing. They would do this not necessarily if they were succeeding, uh, but they would do this if they were failing. Does that mean they're about to make a change in position? I didn't say that. Sanctions which began in the Bush administration took seven years to bring Iran to the table. Iran did not come to the table seeking any deal. They came to the table to see what deal was available, and we responded as a result of a policy decision made by a president of the United States Industrial enrichment would be something we would allow, and we would relieve them of sanctions pressures on those three sanctions. We didn't ask Europe's views of that. We didn't ask the local partners' views on this. So this was something the United States did on its own and later brought the European partners in. So in the end, where do I think things are going? I am very concerned about the lack of a deterrent um, uh, posture of the world against an actor such as Iran. We don't seem to understand how to push back against a country which employs gray zone military tactics. We don't seem to understand how to respond to a country which fights its own versions of forever wars. We now have an air war between Israel and Syria which involved hundreds of sorties, the loss of a plane. We have a missile war in Saudi Arabia. We have cyber wars throughout the region. We have Iranian ground troops in three if not four countries and we have the changing DNA, and we don't have a response posture to this. So I agree this should be an international community response, but if Europe wishes to be relevant, this should be, should be relevant. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, and uh, finally I'll turn to my Washington Institute colleague, Mike Singh, uh, for his thoughts. Thanks, Simon, and uh, thanks to Norm and Suzanne. Uh, for uh, being here with us. Uh, it's great to be part of this panel, and, and thanks to all of you for joining us. I'm going to try to um, keep my remarks brief, which is out of character for me. Um, I'm just going to make a few points, um, try to answer a couple of questions, uh, and then uh, get to the fun part, which is the conversation. Um, the, the first question I want to ask and then answer is, why would Iran do this? And let's assume that Iran did it, um, and I say that not because I have any evidence to unveil to you, but only because the U.S. Uh, and the E3 have all said that they believe Iran did it, and so let's take their word for it uh, as a basis for the conversation. Um, I want to point to four reasons why I think Iran would uh, mount this attack on Saudi Arabia. The first is oil prices. Um, you know, it's, it's maybe a, a straightforward point, but, you know, when we talk about reducing Iran's oil exports, you know, I, I have an economics degree, and so one thing I learned was that revenues equal price times volume. And so any increase in oil prices as Iran's oil exports go down is, of course, useful for Iran. But for oil prices to go up, um, 
you know, we're, the United States is helping to keep oil prices down, of course, not just by producing a lot of oil, but by engaging in a trade war with China, which hurts China's economy um, and reduces demand for oil. To, keep oil. to try to get oil prices up, there needs to be a steady drumbeat of these types of attacks. Uh, because right now, the market assumes that this oil production will be back online quickly, and therefore you don't see a big uh, price reaction. Um, so that's number one, and it's straightforward. Number two, uh, I do think that Iran is trying to make good on something that Iranian officials have long vowed. Um, and again, this is straightforward, but Iranian officials have long said that if they're not uh, able to export oil, neither will their uh, Arab Gulf uh, neighbors be able to export oil. Um, and uh, I think when Iran says these things, it's easy to kind of discount it as bluster, but I think that this is an important effort to make good on that, to ensure the Saudis pay a price for um, working with the United States to stop Iranian exports of oil from Tehran's perspective. Um, third, and, and now sort of get into more kind of interpretive or speculative reasons. Um, third, there is this sense of trying to decouple the United States from our allies. Um, remember, the United States for decades now, um, at least since the Carter Doctrine uh, in 1980, has declared essentially that the free flow of energy through the Persian Gulf, in fact, the Persian Gulf period, uh, is a vital interest of the United States uh, and will act even militarily, if necessary, to defend it. And um, that obviously doesn't sit well with Iran, which would like the United States out of the region. Um, one phenomenon that we're seeing as a result of these attacks, and my co-panelists have alluded to this, is the United States in a sort of um, sometimes implicit, other times explicit way, repudiating the Carter Doctrine, repudiating the idea that we have an interest uh, in what's going on in the Gulf. Um, President Trump, when tankers were attacked in the Gulf, basically his response was, not our tankers, which is very different than the response that the United States had in the late 1980s. When this facility was attacked, what do you hear from much of the kind of political elite here in Washington? Saudi Arabia was attacked. What does that have to do with us? Why should we defend Saudi Arabia? You don't hear American vital interests have been challenged. We need to do something. This is more valuable, I think, to Iran than just about anything else. What, what would Iran pay for the United States to say, um, we're no longer interested in the Gulf and what happens there, and we're no longer committed to our allies there? I think it might be worth the cost to Iran that it's paying. I don't know. I don't know how Iran would, would weigh that, but it's certainly something valuable. Uh, and the comments that we're seeing, it's, I think, notable, are not just coming from President Trump. Um, but they're coming from prominent Democrats, uh, they're coming from the American public, um, and they're even to some extent coming from allies, because our allies in the region, as my co-panelists have noted, are themselves not sure they want to call on the United States to do something. Now that's in part because they're risk averse, but it's also in part because they understand that the next administration might not um, have the same approach to Iran and they don't want to be left hung out to dry uh, in a fight with Iran. And then fourth, the fourth reason why Iran might do this is, I think, exactly what um, Suzanne and Norm were getting at. I think that since especially the United States made the decision to try to reduce Iran's oil exports to zero, Iran made a decision that it needed to change the rules of the game with the United States uh, and in the Gulf. Um, and it perceived that it had really two sources, two good sources of leverage against the United States. One being nuclear escalation. Uh, nuclear escalation because of two factors. One, this is the issue the world cares about. Frankly, the world has never been too moved by uh, instability in the region, by Iranian support for terrorism, and so on and so forth. When we were uh, in the 2000s trying to drum up support for UN Security Council sanctions, we didn't go and say, hey, Iran is supporting terrorism, um, because Iran had been supporting terrorism for decades, and it didn't prompt much of a response. We said, look, Iran is developing nuclear weapons, and that gets the attention of Europeans, Asians, uh, and others. Um, so Iran knows that it can also use this to its benefit, that it can get the attention of these countries um, by escalating its nuclear activities. Uh, the second factor, I think, behind that is that sanctions take time to work uh, even when they do work, um, which is not all the time, frankly. Um, the nuclear crisis can escalate very quickly, and so Iran can essentially take control of the timeline uh, through these types of uh, escalation. On the regional side, I think it's obvious, we've, we've all pointed to it, Iran understands that it has a greater risk tolerance in the Middle East than the United States does right now. It has a greater commitment to being in the Middle East, where of course it's stuck um, along with our allies, than the United States does. The United States is hesitant uh, about our role in the Middle East. Um, we have been hesitant about our role in the Middle East for uh, 
probably 10 years plus now. Um, and so pushing on us, which is I think what Iran has been trying to do in Iraq and now in the Gulf, um, they perceive as a successful strategy and we have yet to prove them wrong. So four reasons why Iran may have done this. Just a couple of other questions. Does this reflect desperation or confidence? This kind of gets to the question of is maximum pressure working? The norm answer. I would argue the two don't necessarily, they're not mutually exclusive. Uh, one can be both confident and desperate uh, at the same time uh, in this context. I think Iran is probably confident that it has a winning kind of approach here uh, to the United States and our allies. Um, and yet, this may also at the same time, this effort to build leverage um, is something you may also um, see as a prelude to an eventual negotiation with the United States. Again, I think the two are not mutually exclusive, uh, and you could say that about almost any country engaged in these types of activities. You can uh, believe your strategy is working even as you're running out of uh, tools or options to use. Um, third question, uh, what should we expect next from Iran? I agree with Suzanne, uh, who said we should expect more of this. Um, for the reasons I've, are, sort of, I've laid out already as to why I think Iran is doing it, um, until they have achieved their purpose, which I think is primarily to change American policy or get the United States out of the region, um, you shouldn't expect to change. I, you should expect more of the same. And in fact, um, maybe more of the same doesn't quite capture it, because I think what we see Iran doing is um, they will mount one type of attack. We will respond to prevent another attack like that one, and then they'll do something different. So after they attacked tankers, what did we do? We had this effort to construct this maritime coalition. Um, the next attack wasn't on tankers. It was on this facility. Now we're, we've apparently moved some troops and missile defenses there. The next attack probably won't be on this facility for sure, uh, or maybe even a similar attack. It'll be something different to kind of force us into this reactive mode um, and start to sort of build up the sense, uh, hopefully uh, for them in uh, the United States, that these things that we're doing are pointless. Um, because the aircraft carriers we surged or the bombers we surged last time, of course, didn't do any good against this particular kind of attack. And so the most important question, what should we do in light of all of this? Well, what, for one thing, I think we should stop being reactive. We need to instead try to put Iran uh, on the back foot, um, and not just to anticipate what Iran is doing, but force Iran uh, to react to the things that we're doing. Um, Norm was asking the question of, um, has maximum pressure been successful? Uh, I personally would say we do not have a maximum pressure policy against Iran. We have a maximum sanctions policy against Iran, but sanctions so far is the only tool that we are willing to use with respect to Iran. Um, and our view of pressure uh, is a view uh, that is very much through our own eyes, the things that we value. But when you're thinking about carrots and sticks um, with respect to a state like Iran, you have to ask yourself, what does pressure mean or what does a carrot mean uh, for the interests of this regime as this regime sees it? Um, and I think that that doesn't just mean economic sanctions. The regime has lived with economic sanctions for a long time. Some in the regime may even benefit from economic sanctions, either politically or even materially uh, in some respects. We have other forms of pressure. Um, we have military pressure. Uh, I would argue that the types of attacks we've seen um, demand deterrence. Uh, and that deterrence so far has failed. Iran hasn't paid a price for its attacks on tankers, its, its attacks on Abqaiq, um, or frankly for its attacks, as Norma is laying out, for much of what it's done uh, to challenge the United States over the past several decades. Um, we have to be willing to engage in um, a kinetic response to Iran's kinetic activities um, in a way, hopefully, that doesn't escalate. But I would argue that inaction also produces escalation that when you prioritize non-escalation over everything else, you get escalation anyway. And that's what we're seeing playing out today. But I would argue that diplomacy also constitutes pressure uh, on Iran, which is why I think we should be willing to use it. On all of the issues that we're talking about, um, with the sole exception, I would argue, of the JCPOA, there's actually unity amongst the United States and our allies um, when it comes to Iran's activities in Syria, in Iraq, its support for terrorism, its attacks on shipping. There's unity amongst the United States and our allies. But we have failed to harness that in any meaningful way. Uh, and instead, we have ceded, really, the diplomatic field to the Europeans, to Iran, and so forth. Um, in any kind of diplomatic discussion of these issues, we have an advantage. Iran is isolated. And so we should be looking to use that, again, to pressure Iran. I think that would constitute pressure uh, as the Iranians see it. I think they wouldn't feel comfortable with that. Um, I think also, though, at the end of the day, um, 
we need to remember why we're in the Middle East, why we have been in the Middle East, why we're there today, and why we're probably going to continue to be there. Um, we're, when people say, well, we shouldn't respond to this because why should we defend Saudi Arabia? It's a fundamental misunderstanding of why we're in the Middle East. We're in the Middle East because we have interests at stake in the Middle East. When we act in the Middle East, it's to defend our interests, not to act as kind of a deputy to our allies or on behalf of our allies. Um, if we didn't have interest in the Middle East, my view is we wouldn't be there in, in the way that we are. Um, and so this is something I think we need to reevaluate. Uh, we need to remind ourselves of the interests that we do have in the region, um, why we're there, and why, therefore, um, this type of incident is so important. It's not because Saudi Arabia was attacked. The Saudis are a partner, and I think it should matter to us that our partners and allies are attacked. But that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is this is a challenge to American interests. Um, and if we're not willing to defend our interests, our interests are inevitably going to suffer. Thank you. Uh, Mike, thank you very much. Uh, well, we've uh, had three very uh, interesting um, presentations. I'm glad that Mike um, introduced the word deterrence uh, in his presentation. I'd wondered, I thought it was a lost word uh, in the discussions uh, until now. Uh, I wanted to um, start the discussion by um, uh, uh, putting forward a hypothetical uh, which might be a reality rather than a hypothetical is that it's all very well for us to sit around here and discuss these issues and presumably although the weekend is approaching uh, much of Washington is discussing the issues as well but uh, what happens next um, when does Iran do its next thing uh, Rouhani was in New York City this week. He's now back home, as far as I understand. Uh, so um, Iran's week of diplomacy in uh, the United Nations is over. Uh, and so it's uh, back to whatever the Revolutionary Guard um, might come up with and uh, propose to the Supreme Leader. And the Supreme Le Leader uh, nods or whatever he does. And uh, they go ahead and do it. Uh, and so we don't actually have much time. Uh, what would be the um, panel's advice uh, to the president um, of how to stop the attack next week? I put it like that. I don't know what the attack is going to be. Uh, but uh, to my mind, the attack on Ab Cake which was a hugely important uh, installation, um, was uh, sort of broke the bounds of a limpet mine here or a drone attack there. Uh, this is now on a, uh, where we've stepped up a couple of steps on this one. Uh, is there, uh, what can the president or any other member of the administration say this weekend which can stop the next attack, or are we just going to sit and wait for it to happen? Suzanne. Well, I don't think it's a question of rhetoric from the president um, in, if we're looking to, in fact, stop the next attack. I think what we have to do is uh, what both, I think what we've all uh, essentially advocated on this panel, which is to demonstrate to Tehran that there will be some real cost in terms of their presence in the region, in terms of their freedom of mobility, in terms of their own interests in the region, um, as a result of the actions that they've undertaken to date. And what we know to, so far is that the President has re responded in July with some cyber action, and that he responded to the attack on Abkhaz with uh, the redundant sanctions on the Central Bank. Neither of those impose a significant enough cost to change the Iranian calculus. Um, I think we are in a difficult position because I think the Iranians are, as both of my co-panelists said, more risk tolerant. They're prepared. Uh, they were prepared, I'm quite confident, for a much more significant set of reprisals than they've seen to date from the actions that they've taken. And they calculated that it was in their interest to, to take that risk and to absorb those reprisals if they, in fact, came. So I think we are uh, facing a difficult uh, predicament um, in the sense that there is zero political support at this point among 
this administration or, or among uh, the American people for a, a meaningful undertaking in the Middle East um, to push back the Iranians. We have other interests at stake in Iraq um, that I think mitigate against taking action there. Uh, we have limited capacity in other in other arenas where the Iranians are have maybe more exposed, uh, and so I think that we are in a position where uh, our 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 options are not particularly good. Norm said that we have a lot of them, um, and so I uh, am interested to hear what he would recommend. Uh, thank you. We actually have a number of options, but options all have costs. If you want to stop Iran. From, a, from building a presence in Syria, it's relatively easy to significantly constrain that. You do an air cap and you stop all aircraft from Iran to Damascus. There will be secondary consequences. So the issue of diplomacy, which means negotiations, concessions, what are you giving up that doesn't belong to you because you're 8,000 miles away, is also the same with costs. What are you going to do that actually has a cost that's going to touch someone else's discussion? So examples of things that could be done. Cake was an attack on the world. Bangladesh paid more for its energy that day, as probably did Finland and Australia. Frankly, I would think a legal case could be put once the evidence is put forward for the confiscation of Iranian property in all those countries to compensate them. Now, that's a rather extreme and outrageous statement. But once you get, unless you're willing to touch the extreme in that regard and be willing to take the consequences, then as Susan has correctly stated, you immediately fall into the trap of, you know, we can't hit them and touch them in Iraq because we, we're so concerned about Iraq. We have war fighters in the Middle East. Something might happen to them. You become self-constraining. On, the on the diplomatic focus, we have had some powerful discussions with the United Nations this week. They were all behind the scenes, and rhetoric did not, did not mask much of this. It, it really masked much of this. But in the end of the day, European countries have to be compelled, this is not going to come from asking, that they have to stand up for their rights in the region as well. I think the Trump administration's policy is similar, as I say, to other administrations. They should just continue. Iran is doing this because sooner or later, economic unrest will threaten the regime. That is what has moved them every time they've moved in the past. They did not come to the JCPOA for any other reason than concern about their, their the political stability. But we're playing a long game. We can't defend all parts of the wall. We've had some successes, and I'll close on this. There have been successes in the region, but you have to measure successes like successes in a dread disease. It doesn't cure the disease, but it could have been worse. Iran has been blunted in Syria. That's an astounding thing to say. The Israelis have conducted hundreds of airstrikes. And Iran has been prevented from building a missile base, a naval base, and several other constructs. That's public knowledge now and can be stated. That happened sometime in the past. The strikes continue because Iran has, isn't stopping, but they have changed their behavior. The Saudis and the Emiratis have constrained Iran and Yemen. That's a shocking statement. But Iran had more significant plans in Sana than they have been able to achieve. And that happened because the international community tightened the Oman border and prevented Iran from conducting activities in Sana'a. But you still have the problem in Sana'a. So I think as you think about what you want to do next, you have to think about not just those consequences and avoid the endless discussion of uh, the interagency meetings that, that we've attended where you dance around the decision tree and have everyone in the room say, but this will cause this, this will cause this, let's have another meeting in 10 days. That works, frankly, respectfully in think tanks, but in the real world where you have off personnel who will die or something happening the next day, you don't have that option. Um, the U.S. should continue what it's doing, build a coalition with partners, put a military presence in the region. We've communicated to the Iranians, if you touch Americans, the response will be sharp and direct, and that had, uh, had an effect. But we should not be compelled to be pushed into a war simply because Iran is moving this. And, and one footnote, none of our allies, and I've spoken to the senior leadership of four Arab countries in the last week and a half, None of them are trying to send Americans to war tomorrow. In fact, some of them worry that if that war happens, it's all going to be fought in their living rooms, bedrooms, and, and backyards. So they're cognizant to that, but they do need our long-term support in the international community. Mike. Well, I disagree with Norm that interagency meetings couldn't be an effective deterrent. Um, we just need to make the Iranians attend the interagency meetings, um, and then they wouldn't want any more to do with us, I think. Um, just three quick points. Uh, one, the question of when will it 
when will the Iranian strike next, I think, is a tough question to answer. In the days even before the Abkhak attack, um, the questions I was getting were, well, why have the Iranians stopped? How did we win? Uh, what happened? Um, and, of course, then the next attack happens. And it may be that there was a lull, or it may be that the Iranians did things that we simply didn't connect, and we simply didn't connect the dots. And we have colleagues here at the Institute who follow Iraq, who follow Yemen, um, and, you know, if you look at something that happens emanating from Yemen or something that happens in Iraq, um, is that part of a campaign by Iran, or is it simply sort of something that's endogenous to that particular uh, theater? We don't always know um, whether we're talking about analysts on the outside or U.S. government analysts. And so it may be that Iran sometimes tries to get our attention and fails. Um, so we may not recognize the next thing when we see it, or we may uh, understand what it is. Um, second, uh, when it comes to deterrence, we've talked a lot about deterrence by punishment. What can we do to punish Iran? Um, but there's other forms of deterrence. We can uh, also practice deterrence by denial. Um, and to me, there's two key forms to that when it comes to what we're seeing now with Iran. One is to ensure that we are um, hardening the soft targets in the region to the extent we can. There's, of course, a limited amount of that one can do. Um, but to the extent we're better able to defend potential targets, um, better able to collect intelligence, to share intelligence, and so forth, so that Iran might fear that it gets caught. Um, of course, Iran was caught in several cases in the past and still didn't uh, suffer many consequences. Um, we should practice that kind of deterrence as well. Um, I would argue uh, also, though, that much of what we're seeing from Iran is opportunistic, that, in fact, Ar Iran's perceived strength is a fact is a function of the weakness uh, of some of the other governments in the region, and so we shouldn't also neglect the effort to strengthen our partners in the region. Uh, from my point of view, the stronger the government in Baghdad, for example, the harder that is for makes life for Iran. Um, and yet, when we see what's happening inside Iraq with, say, the Iranian-backed militias and so forth, there is one sort of tendency, one strain of thought in Washington, which is. Um, well, to heck with Iraq. That, to me, actually helps Iran. The, the more we say, well, we're going to abandon these partners because they're difficult or they're um, unsatisfactory, the more we play into Iran's strategy. Um, just the third point, very briefly, we also, though, need to recognize there is a high bar for deterrence. Remember, Iran is already paying a very high price um, for American policy. It's, we have very significant sanctions in place. And so we should anticipate that because they're paying this high price, that there will be a similarly high bar to deter them from engaging in future attacks. Uh, before uh, I open it uh, to uh, the people here in, at the Institute today, uh, just one further um, question uh, to the panel. The um, PR uh, of uh, the attacks, the PR emanating out of uh, Washington, uh, since the attacks began um, back in May, uh, was the limpet mines on the tankers out of uh, anchored off Fujairah, um, has uh, essentially labeled Iran uh, as being likely, uh, but has failed to uh, really provide the level of evidence uh, and therefore confidence. Uh, in, one, uh, in the American position uh, that we should be um, agitated about. Uh, and this, um, uh, to my mind, a f failure to uh, s give the best case has resulted in other countries uh, also uh, being a uh, weak on this. Uh, the Emiratis um, said they needed more evidence before um, they were certain that it was uh, the Iranians at fault. Uh, the Saudis have said uh, it was probably Iran, but we're examining the evidence. Uh, and we uh, have said um, uh, uh, we're trying to gather together the evidence so we can give an ironclad case of what it was about. Uh, it, it's obvious uh, to uh, the average person who was at fault. Uh, so, uh, have we played it wrong? Uh, 
do we continue to play it this way or do we need to revise the way that we tell the story and stop uh, being um, uncertain about what's going on? Suzanne. Um, I, I don't actually think that there's much of an issue with the, the sort of pro provision of hard intelligence to demonstrate Iranian culpability here. I think, you know, there is always a, a degree of skepticism. That degree of skepticism toward American claims in the Middle East is going to be higher uh, as a result of the uh, events of the prior, past 20 years. Uh, particularly around Iraq, and it's going to be higher for this administration because this administration has demonstrated that it, it does not always stick to the facts. Um, but I, you know, I don't see a sort of reluctance to support U.S. policy because of a lack of conviction that, in fact, it was Iran to blame. We have, in fact, a really strenuous statement this week from Britain, France, and Germany uh, pointing precisely the finger at Iran, which I think was an important step forward. I think the reluctance that we have uh, from our, our traditional allies and partners is a frustration with what they believe to be a, a, a self, a self -o -o own goal. Um, that essentially the Trump administration kicked off this kind of a crisis, is unwilling to engage in the more forward-leaning diplomacy that would be necessary to try to come to a resolution of the crisis, and that they don't want, that or some of our traditional partners don't want to be left holding the bag. I don't think the, the Emiratis in particular uh, have uh, sort of uh, fudged the case around Iranian culpability because they're not convinced or because we haven't given them enough information. I think what it demonstrates to me that both the decision to uh, avoid uh, naming the Iranians and also the decision to reopen uh, maritime security talks with the Iranians and, and uh, shift their own position in Yemen is a, is a creeping recognition that the United States isn't going to be able to solve the problem of Iran and that uh, unintentional escalation will hurt the Emirati interests more than, uh, than the alternatives. And so they're looking to preserve their own interests by hedging their bets with the Iranians. And I think we're going to see more of that as it's clear that, that the Trump administration takes fundamentally a transactional approach to uh, American military presence and to broader questions of regional security. I, I agree with Suzanne, maybe with a couple of minor quibbles. Uh, this isn't an issue of evidence. We have warehouses filled with weaponry from Iran. The Iranians themselves, after denying presences and locations, had funerals for their leading generals in countries. There's nobody that doubts that EFPs killed 608 Americans, our national treasure, or wounded uh, several thousand more. I'm not sure the, 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 the wounded number has, has been made public yet. Uh, this isn't a question of evidence. A uh, word that you often hear is, we have to fear miscalculation. I've never understood that. And usually the people who use the phrase miscalculation haven't spent a lot of time calculating. It's actually the issue of everything has secondary consequences that you can't predict and the people around the various leadership tables, to include in Iran, are very knowledgeable of what our military is able to do in the region. Our aircraft carrier task group, what we have at Udaid and Arif John, what is publicly available in the air, what they see as our ships go in and out, is just a hair short of wrath of God. And they know this, there is no doubt about this, but intent becomes a crystal ball issue. I think the question becomes, people know there's a day after. If the United States or the, Sa if the Saudis declare Iran to attack our soil, they are compelled to treat this as an act of war. If the Emiratis were to make such a claim, it's an act of war. Countries need to respond to act of war. So you can't just say, please don't hurt me. My one quibble, the United States did not bring this about. I attended almost, again, apolitical, worked for Republicans and Democrats. I attended almost every meeting of the nuclear uh, negotiations from Oman to Vienna. That was all about constraining Iran's nuclear program, sure, and it did to an extent, and we won't go into that. But it was also about Ira offering Iran a chance to change its path, and Iran chose not to. And going back to my earlier statement of, you can say we would stick to JCPOA and, and the deal and negotiate Iran out of Syria or Lebanon or Yemen 
or you could take actions. And as a policymaker, you have diplomacy, don't hurt me again, Demarsh, sanctions, which take years to have effect, or you go to war. This is inevitable that if you wish to constrain Iran's regional behavior, which threaten the lives of Americans, you have to choose one of those three options. And for the Americans under the heads of those missiles, they're really not interested in waiting seven to eight years. So if I, if I sound harsh in that regard, in those conversations, think in the end, those Americans under those missiles, what do you do to protect them besides saying, we will have two conferences this year and next in Europe? Just a, just a brief uh, point to add, which is you know, the Iranians practice plausible deniability. Um, well, they, even they, implausible deniability. Or let's say deniability. Attributable but deniable is the phrase. Uh, however you want to put it. Um, even when it's clear that they've done something, and even when they also sort of uh, gloat about the thing that they've denied. Um, but plausible deniability has two sides, right? It's If the other side is denying that they did it, that also gives the target room to, as I think Norm was alluding to, choose the time and the manner and the place uh, of their response. Um, and so we see this in the region. Um, the Israelis are particularly skilled at this. Um, basically not owning an attack and sometimes not owning the response and allowing this stuff to happen um, a bit in the shadows. What I think you don't want to do is what we've done in this case, um, which is rush to say they did it and then realize you're not sure how you want to respond and say now we're gathering the evidence. Um, this has this sort of smacks of ad hocery and, and this is this would be my criticism. Um, once you pin the blame on Iran then the natural question that arises is, okay, so what are you going to do about it? And the United States and the E3 have all pinned the blame on Iran, and yet there is no clear response. Um, that is, to me, the, the sort of the worst way you could go about this. Thank you. All right. Uh, I'm now going to open the uh, uh, floor to questions. Uh, I see s several. Uh, we'll start with this gentleman over here. Uh, please uh, speak into the microphone. It helps us hear and certainly helps the people who are watching it on the web. Uh, and please um, uh, identify yourself and please um, ask a question rather than give a speech. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hamdi Rafai from Council of United Syrian Americans. Uh, I had the privilege yesterday of listening to you, Mr. Singh, uh, at the uh, Syrian report release. I'm sorry? I said not everyone would call that a privilege. Right. Well, it, I, I thought it was pretty good. Uh, in any case, I guess my question is that why aren't we doing more to encourage Saudi Arabia to engage in Syria to counter Iran? And what do we consider as countering Iran? Um, I mean, we, we're always talking about, you know, kinetic action. We're always talking about strategy. but. Clearly, the, the idea that Israel is countering Iran and Syria is not correct. They may only have 2,500 troops, I think you cited yesterday, in Syria, but Damascus looks like Iran now, and people are speaking Farsi. Uh, I mean, they seem to be doing this differently by a battle of hearts and minds. So should we be doing more to encourage Saudi Arabia to engage in Syria? and? Is the UAE, is, are the Emiratis still our allies in this, considering that in Assad's uh, last uh, conference in Syria, business conference, everyone there was an Emirati. They, they seem to be all in against our policies against Iran. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, so maybe I'll just say a couple of things in response to that. Uh, um, and of course, if Suzanne and Norm have anything to say as well. Um, I, I think so. So, I think your point is is well taken, uh, and I think, frankly, that uh, my sense is from conversations I've had with them that Israeli officials would probably agree with you that the Israeli strikes have stopped Iran from engaging in certain activities, in placing significant weapon systems, um, turning Syria into sort of a forward missile base, uh, let's say, for Iran. But it hasn't stopped Iran from trying to embed itself, entrench itself deeply within the fabric of Syria's economy and society, and frankly, airstrikes cannot do that, won't do that. Um, those would require a different set of tools, and I think those tools are ultimately primarily economic and diplomatic uh, 
in nature, and I think they largely look to the United States and our international partners to lead that effort. Um, as far as the Saudis and Emiratis go, it, it seems to me, I can't speak for uh, U.S. policy, but it seems to me that what the United States has asked of these partners um, is largely threefold. One is um, join us in isolating the Assad regime. Um, and I would argue that for the most part they have done that. Yes, the United States I think was unhappy with um, some of the UAE's activities recently, but I think that that's actually fairly limited. Number two is um, don't fund the wrong people in Syria. In other words, don't take things into your own hands and fund groups which ultimately in the long run are going to um, undermine uh, the, our cause in Syria, our interest in Syria, and not help, um, just out of some short-term desire to fight uh, Iran. Um, and then number three is pay up, essentially. Uh, the United States has been trying to recruit our Gulf partners to pay for stabilization, reconstruction, and so forth in the northeast of Syria. Um, but we have shied away from asking for direct involvement from these partners, I think for two good reasons. Number one is we know the answer would probably be no, um, that they wouldn't do it. Uh, and you try not to make requests of your partners when you know the answer is no. Um, number two, um, we have local partners in Syria, especially in northeastern Syria, who themselves are quite competent um, and probably don't need or want that kind of external uh, involvement. Um, you know, Syria has a lot of external involvement as it is and probably doesn't need much more, uh, is what I would say. I would just make one brief comment. We don't structure, we and our allies are not structured to do what Iran does in the region. We have traditional militaries, traditional diplomacy. You, you will often hear me say that diplomacy has meaning or miscalculation has meaning. Uh, the, the three words part, proxy, partner, and surrogates are often batted about as if they're the same thing. We don't run proxies. We barely work with surrogates. We do engage partners. The Saudis, the Emiratis, the Kuwaitis, they are not capable of creating proxy forces similar to Iran. They can engage partners. And the one area, just, and, I, and you raised a good point, sir, we don't really see publicly everything Iran is doing in Syria to transform the DNA of that country, which they're doing, I can assure you. But you also don't see what a partner does. So partners of a Saudi or the Emiratis or the United States in the region would traditionally be commercial. You would traditionally look to see build up political entities based on stable economic financial transactions, and that becomes an, an offset or an alternative to Iran's influence. That becomes, that's weak, takes a lot of years, but it's not entirely unsuccessful. I believe that just as we don't see what the Iranians are doing in Syria, that, that commercial transformation of Iraq, I think, is happening. But within Syria itself and Damascus, that will be difficult. Our Syria Defense Force partners, they're not surrogate nor proxies, in northeastern Syria have very little influence in Damascus or Dara or on the Golan Heights. And you can't really expect that if we have 1,000 or 50,000 troops in, in the SDF territory, that we're going to have that dramatic a change on what Iran is able to do on the ground in the neighborhoods of Damascus where they're buying property where they're bringing in people and proselytizing. Thank you, sir. Uh, Suzanne, did you want to make a comment? I'll just make one comment, which is that based on the Saudi experience in prosecuting the war in Yemen, I think uh, the proposal that they should somehow insert themselves in uh, Syria is one that would not work to the benefit of either the Syrian people or uh, American interests in the region. Thank you. Gentlemen at the back there. Hi, my name is Nathan Toronto. I have just returned from the Emirates where I taught senior leader strategy and security and decision making. Um, and I, I'd like to say that I'm very glad that my family and I are not part of the 20,000 Americans that are in the UAE right now. Um, the, and I've heard both in, in Washington and in Abu Dhabi uh, a lot of strong rhetoric against Iran, you know, vilifying Iran, or um, not seeing the possibility that they can be reformed, right? So my, my question is, if we're talking about negotiations, returning to the negotiating table somehow, what is it that we do give up? What behavior by Iran are we willing to tolerate in order to sit down with them? Um, because I agree that, yeah, we need to send a message, but we also need to couple that with diplomacy. 
Great question. So what do we give up? Uh, Suzanne. Um, I'm, I guess I'm not entirely sure what the question is. What do we give up to negotiate? Well, the what, what kind of an agreement would we be willing to abide by? So the, the stances of the, the U.S. and Iran are pretty um, hard set, right? But it, Iran wants us to, to stop the sanctions before they negotiate, and we want them to uh, stop uh, supporting uh, proxy groups and, and terrorism in the region, right? Um, are uh, who who moves first? How what are what are we willing to to concede on in order to get to the table? Not 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 in terms of the final agreement. I'm just getting to the table. Look, I think um, the reality is we're going to have to come up with a, a framework that looks something like the joint plan of action, the interim nuclear deal, that, but one that's broader. I don't think, the, and I think this is what's important about the statement by the three European powers this week, this is, we, we can no longer compartmentalize uh, our, our negotiation with Iran. This is going to be a broader negotiation. It's going to, I think, almost inevitably have a broader uh, array of, of stakeholders, if not direct participants in the negotiations. Um, but we're going to have to come up with a set of uh, commitments that we're prepared to abide by, and, and that will include sanctions relief or sanction, temporary sanctions waivers, and a set of commitments from the Iranians that they're prepared to abide by. Obviously, the starting point there is full compliance with the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. I think given other events, uh, developments going on within the region, you could look to some uh, commitments around supporting a process of negotiations and ceasefire in Yemen and other steps of this kind. But I don't think we're going to see a, 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 a there's n almost no likelihood of getting a set of preemptive Iranian commitments to change their overall regional strategy or their relationships with partners of, uh, that are decades old uh, in, 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 re in exchange for negotiations themselves. Um, so I have a different view on, on this question, I'll, on, on both sides of it. So on the question of what do we need to give up to get talks, uh, to me, the answer is nothing. I, I think that um, we shouldn't have to uh, and we don't have to, I think, pay the Iranians to come into negotiations. Every president since Jimmy Carter has ended up having talks of some kind with the Iranians. And, and most of those times, the Iranians have willingly wanted to talk to the United States because they have seen, seen it as serving their interest to do so. I think the, the problem right now um, is that um, from Iran's perspective, as far as I can figure it, um, they have, they're, they're looking at sort of two possibilities. One is um, that they can wait the Trump administration out, a Democrat's elected next year, um, and then they don't really have to do anything because um, then people will be eager to talk to them, eager to maybe even come back to the JCPOA, um, modified or unmodified. Um, and so they don't need to do anything to make that happen. It will happen. Second, they have um, the Trump administration. President Trump has made clear that he's eager for a meeting with President Rouhani. So that is a card for them to play, essentially, something that they think they can probably get a high price for. Um, and so what we need to do, I think, is actually um, sort of stop sort of seeming so eager for this meeting and for this comprehensive bigger, better deal um, and be willing to be patient if, in fact, that's the policy. If your policy is sanctions and pressure, uh, I think it has to be a patient policy. Um, when it comes to the idea of what should we be negotiating ultimately once talks start, I'm very skeptical about the idea of a comprehensive deal. Um, number one, I don't think getting a comprehensive deal is possible. Maybe I should sort of end my comments there because that's the, that's the bottom line in a sense. I don't think that there is an agreement to be reached with Iran on all these different issues, and I'm not sure I understand why this has entered into kind of our consciousness as something that's necessary. If you look Throughout history, rarely have we tried for comprehensive deals with adversaries. Usually we have limited deals with adversaries. Um, number two, I think that um, negotiating over these issues in a bilateral context with Iran actually gives Iran far more leverage. I go back to what I said before about if you were to gather countries together and talk about Syria, uh, Iran would be kind of the odd man out sort of standing over by the buffet by himself while the rest of us all kind of agree on what should happen. Why would we want to get everybody else out of the room and have the conversation one-on-one -on -one with Iran where ultimately then you put them uh, in their position on an equal footing with ours? The rest of the world agrees with us on most of these issues. And bilateral negotiation with Iran just changes the power dynamic in their favor. Um, 
Number three. Seems to be working in their favor at the moment. What's that? In Syria. The power dynamic in Syria seems to be working in their favor at the moment. So I'm not sure that negotiations actually empower them more than. I, I would argue that I would argue that that's maybe a reason to commit to diplomacy in Syria, which I think the administration, you know, is more or less committed to. Um, although the president has wavered on the question of troops, um, not a reason to bilaterally negotiate with the Iranians on Syria. But but three, I would say, even the process of negotiating can strengthen Iran. The, the, this this optic or dynamic of the United States and Iran sitting to hash out the region's issues is a terrible, terrible dynamic uh, for us, and it's great for Iran, and it's terrible for our allies. So I agree. Just a few brief points. Iran is easy to talk to. Every administration since Carter has had multiple back channels, front channels, real and imagined that I mean, this is, it's, 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 it's one of the most astounding things I've seen in my career, the number of interactions we've had with the Iranian government. The second issue is that, it, that Iran needs to be ready to make a concession, and we should be careful about concessions that don't belong to us. I've had a number of Gulf countries tell me they understand what it's like to be Czech or Polish in the 1930s and to wake up one morning and to hear that someone from the UK or France decided half of you are under the Poles and half of you are under the Germans. And we think it's a good deal. I mean, we just think it's a good deal. And the League of Nations is pretty quiet about this right now, just the UN Security Council is pretty quiet about it. The third thing is I don't see, and I, I, it's probable Susan and perhaps others would disagree with me, I see no strategic driver whatsoever for Iran to negotiate. The strategic drivers that have compelled Iran to deal with the West have to do with stability, transition, stature, engagement with the United States, et cetera, et cetera. There are no pressures yet in Iran that would compel the decision makers behind negotiations, not people who sometimes come out, not people we talk to, but the people who actually authorize neg real negotiations. There are no, there's no circumstance right now that says they should do this at present. And what they've got with splitting international coalitions, the United States' problem with Europe, or problems with the United Nations, it's not a bad position for them. And they are building facts on the ground. As that DNA changes in the region, that's very hard to reverse. And if you're in the Quds Force right now, or you're in some of their other elements, time is, is indeed on your, on your, your behavior, on your, on your, in your, what you want for the future. I would close with one point, and that is, when we talk about creating something like JCPOA, uh, JCPOA was something we did uh, without telling the Europeans. So you'll have the Europeans say that the Trump administration, after publicly announcing in three speeches they're going to pull out of JCPOA and not getting what it perceived to be a satisfactory response from Europe, violated European rights or et cetera, et cetera, or its role in the region. The Obama administration did not go to Europe on the JCPOA. I was there, trust me. Or the Israelis or anyone else. They made the decision and then told the Europeans. I was there and had discussions with the Europeans afterwards, none of whom, by the way, said they thought this was a bad idea, for just, just point of fact. They were in favor of it. But we closed that deal, we're talking about that was a small for small, you know, j nuclear, sounds like a big deal, but for, for something, but it wasn't the whole package, versus big for big. But we promised to do a follow-up, and this is my final point. When we talk about dealing with, with Iran like we did with the Soviets, you can deal with them in some areas, push back in others. That's true. How much of that pushback did we do regarding the Hungarians and the Estonians and East Berlin for how many decades? All right, so there are limits. And the second point is when the international community, this was not just the Obama administration, when the P5 plus 1 agreed to that deal, how exactly did they push back on Iran's missile program or its, uh, uh, or its regional activity? And instead, they became susceptible to the endless series of harangues from Zarif and others that if we don't have sanctions relief, the hardliners will collapse this deal as facts are developed on the ground. I believe, and I said it so twice, but I will close at this point, that bringing Iran into Syria had profoundly negative consequences for the Syrians, profoundly. It just allowed Zarif to represent interests that no other state should have in a country. They weren't there to talk about the Islamic shrines. They were there to talk about the Quds force on the ground and keeping a war criminal in power. Bringing them into Yemen 
would get you another version of Assad in, in Yemen. And we need to think about what that means for Yemenis as well as for Syrians. Thank you. Uh, I'll turn to uh, Rob Satloff, who wants to ask a question. This is a fascinating discussion in many respects um, about different types of issues. Um, a, a very interesting discussion about what moves Iran, uh, what deterrence, uh, what we would have to do to achieve a deterrence. But I want to go back, if I can, to a point that Suzanne made in her opening remarks and take us up to 40,000 feet for a minute, where if I understood you correctly, Suzanne, you were suggesting that we may be at a watershed moment in American foreign policy. It's always tough to tell when you're at a watershed moment. You never really know whether it's as pivotal. Sometimes it might take years to know if you're, if you're at that moment. But you suggested that we may be at a moment where the, um, uh, 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 where the traditional um, uh, uh, notion of American interests in the Gulf may no longer apply, where we don't have the popular support for it, we don't have the congressional support for it, um, uh, where we don't have the leadership commitment to it. Um, uh, uh, and that we're seeing that, and we're seeing the Iranians perhaps brilliantly ex um, recognizing that and driving a stake through the heart of uh, the dying breath of, they're mixing lots of metaphors here, through the dying breath of that, you know, American interests in the Gulf. Um, um, or perhaps not. Maybe this is just a passing moment. Maybe MBS will have a successful mea culpa moment and we will wake up in a week or two with a strengthened and reinvigorated commitment to the Gulf. Um, um, from 40,000 feet, which is it? Are we at that watershed moment where we are, where we are uh, withering, the, the, the American commitment to the Gulf is withering? Or can you see it um, uh, uh, that, that, that we're just passing through a you know, moment of turbulence, but in fact, we will reinvigorate this American commitment that has uh, stood for the last 40 years. Suzanne, you, uh, the question is directed <laughs> at you, so you get first bite at the answer. Well, I, I, I think we are at that watershed moment. I, I don't think it has to mean a dramatic transformation of some of the traditional understanding of our security responsibilities in the region, but I do think that regional partners may see it very differently. We, I would imagine that for regional partners, the, even the shadow of a doubt is going to change the calculus about the way that they navigate this era. But some of the trends that I think have brought us here when it comes to energy supply and markets, when it comes to um, the, the, the relationship between the United States and Saudi Arabia, I don't see reversing anytime soon. Um, and in some ways, this may be simply a reversion to what the Carter Doctrine originally was meant to imply, which was not meant to imply tens or hundreds of thousands of American troops on the ground. It was meant to uh, imply a commitment to a broader uh, economic set of principles and security principles, but not necessarily American presence. That came later, and it became the norm, and it is now understood, at least by some of our partners in the region, as the norm. But it is no longer, I think, tolerable within the American electorate to sustain this kind of a, of a military presence and to engage as deeply and as uh, widely as we have over the course of the past 20 years. And we're going to have to figure out a different model and we're going to have to articulate in a way that's persuasive to our, to our partners in the region so that they don't begin to change their own calculus. What I don't see yet is, is an alternative supplier of security in the Gulf. The Gulf states cannot manage their own security needs. I don't see either the Russians or the Chinese or the Indians or any of the other potential stakeholders, all of whom in many ways are more dependent on supply, energy supplies from the region, moving in to fill the gap that has been left as a result of, of the changing American discussion around these things. So I think we're still the only game in town, but it's a different game than we have at least publicly articulated and, and, and tangibly uh, made good on over the course of the past 20 to 30 years. Mike. Well, thanks for the question and thanks for visiting our institute. Um, I, I'll, uh, you know, I, I think Suzanne makes an excellent point that when the Carter Doctrine was articulated, we didn't have the regional posture that we have now 
And now we have, in a sense, the reverse, which seems to me very dangerous, right? We have a waning commitment, a waning political commitment to the region, and yet the posture is still there. The presence is still there. And that seems to me to set up the possibility of, you know, if there is um, some attack uh, more directly on U.S. interests, U.S. troops, U.S. facilities, and so forth, uh, a much sort of stronger break uh, in U.S. policy where we say, you know, why are we there? Let's just get out uh, in reaction to something. I, I think that's something we should worry about, uh, the sort of presence getting way ahead of the commitment. Um, I, I do worry that we might see uh, this kind of watershed moment, maybe not now, maybe it's sort of happening behind the scenes now, but maybe in the next administration, because I think we're seeing um, basically, let's say, it, three things, and Suzanne mentioned some of this. One is, um, I think the American public is getting tired of the Middle East, simply because uh, it's been sort of, in a, in a sense, too much in the news. We, we've been so engaged in the Middle East, or Iraq and Afghanistan especially, um, that there is a fatigue, for sure. Number two, you have uh, this kind of elite consensus that is formed that this uh, is a all a distraction from our what should be our real priorities, and that's great power competition. Um, and wrongly, I think, but um, this will be the subject of a project I'm doing over the next uh, several months, the Middle East is seen as a distraction from great power competition rather than something which is important to it. I mean, then third, you see the partisan polarization of these issues, um, where support for Saudi Arabia, how one feels about Iran, how one feels about Israel even these days, uh, has become a partisan issue here in Washington. So you can imagine if you say have a, a Democratic administration coming next, that sort of the backlash against allies might be sort of an a sort of organic part of the backlash against the previous administration uh, for them. And so I, I do worry we were sort of at that watershed moment. And, and I think, again, the key question is, well, what do we do about it? Uh, if we are people who think that the U.S. does have interests to defend in the Middle East, I think it means we need to articulate a strategy um, for the Middle East which is um, appropriate to our interests, appropriate to the level of political commitment, appropriate to the overall geopolitical framework uh, in the world of great power competition, if that's indeed our preferred framework, and put out something which looks like uh, a vision which is tailored to today's circumstances and threats and interests and not simply uh, a kind of vestige of past years. I mean, the problem with being old is you start seeing movies over and over. So if I were to tell you we have a anti-Saudi Congress, a relatively compliant president, missiles hitting Iran, hitting Saudi Arabia and oil facilities and Yemeni missiles what should the Saudis do? Well, the last time it happened in the 80s, they bought Chinese CSS-2 missiles. I lived in the Gulf, can't say where, exactly when, but let's just say I spoke with a number of leaders at the time in the early 80s who said, America's been through Vietnam and is tired of war and losses. America's all about the Soviet Union and great power competition. And you won't be there when push comes to shove. When Saddam invaded Kuwait, Jimmy Carter said, not sure this is worth our getting, in, getting into this fight. And I spoke with Jimmy Carter about that. Later, when he came to Kuwait to seek money, but the Kuwaitis gave for charitable purposes. I think the Gulfies, if they're, they, they tend to be the older leaders, were fading away, passing the leadership. They've seen these trends before, but is it a watershed moment? Certainly, energy has changed. That's changed the picture. And the dynamic of trade between the Gulf and China, India, and Pakistan has also changed over the last 11 years. And that's not often, not often seen. But when, when, when push comes to real shove, real shove, we do have a massive presence in the Gulf. We don't give blank checks. That's the other bit of flummery you see in the press. The Obama administration turned down the Arab coalition for things in Yemen. The Trump administration did the same. Anybody who says otherwise is flat wrong. I was in the room and I've heard the Gulf leaders complain about it on each side. I, I just think this is part of life in the region. So I don't know if it's a watershed moment. We'll ask in 20 years, we'll look back and Dennis Ross will have written another 300 page book. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'll turn to um, my goodness. <laughs> I was going to turn to our last question, um, but I'm a generous person. 
Uh, so, um, sorry? Yes. I'd have thought of that. Uh, so I'm going to ask everybody to truncate their question neatly, and then we will take uh, the following. Four. One, two, three, four, maybe five, if it's very <laughs> short. Okay, really quick, uh, I just want to, I'm Dave Pollack, I'm uh, the Bernstein Fellow here at the Washington Institute. I want to ask about possible responses to the Abkhik and Khuris attacks by Iran, or maybe to the next one. What about either overt or covert drone or other kinds of attacks against the Abadan refinery or Kharg Island in Iran, or how about the assassination of Qasem Soleimani? What do you think? I will dive in at one point. Assassination is illegal under U.S. law. No, he's a terrorist. He's a terrorist. I think. I think actually. Right. Uh, we're going to uh, the gentleman there. If you could add. So we've got a um, a covert question, uh, sir. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Jeff Selden with VOA. Wondering if you see Iran as a symptom of a larger problem. There was talk about how there's not a coherent global posture of deterrence about how Iran is using bipartisan, the, 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 the just the, the one-on-one -on -one approach to diplomacy to its advantage. Is this part of a larger problem the world's going to face as the traditional alliances kind of fall apart and there's more of an emphasis on bilateral relations as opposed to institutions and, and, and organizations and alliances? Okay. Uh, Charles. Hi, uh, Shantep, I'm a visiting fellow at the Institute, and I happen to be French, so I thought I, I would react on some of the things about the European uh, perspective. Um, since we don't have much time, I'll stick to one simple question, which is actually w w what kind of EU partners do you want? Because there has been a lot of uh, words about like how the European response was uh, not good enough, but I mean, when you look at the, the, the chronology of the maximum pressure policy, um, there has been like various demand from the U.S. side, which was not clear, at least from the, the, the European perspective. And we had a discussion about kind of what kind of format do you see for the next uh, negotiation? And a key question uh, will be what kind of relationship the U.S. will have with European partners. So how do you see these developments with the new kind of engagement that the administration has? Right. And then two last questions. And the other microphone can come down here. And short. Okay, please. so my question is for Mike Singh. So uh, you spoke about why we're in the Middle East and the fact that we have interests at stake. I was hoping that uh, you could respond to one of the narratives that's kind of going around certain parts of Washington now that my mic went out. No, um, keep that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I know exactly um, that uh, you know there's this sort of narrative that we don't need Gulf oil anymore and you know they're providing all their own security now so we don't really need to be in the Middle East anymore now I disagree with that but I want you to to take a crack at explaining why why you disagree with that okay and now yeah. yeah, and you, you oh, are? Of Har Harz and Nadine, Washington Institute. Uh, you talked about how uh, to deter Iran um, more effectively. My question is about the other side. How successful do you think Iran has been uh, in deterring the United States from uh, responding uh, effectively uh, 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 to, to their uh, provocations? And do, do, don't you think these, these uh, latest attacks will be the beginning of the end of the forward facing? Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'll turn to our panel, and you can pick and choose uh, which of the questions you would like to answer, and I'll try to make sure uh, at least one of you manages to answer uh, every question. Suzanne. Okay. Um, in terms of uh, covert attacks on Iranian oil facilities in response to uh, the attack on Abkhaz, I, I think it's both unnecessary and unwise. We're already uh, essentially cutting off Iran's export prospects that hasn't yet but will sh very soon have an impact on their ability to sustain current levels of production without uh, damaging the fields and they're just running out of storage options. Um, and so 
fundamentally, I, I think, you know, we're, we're going to have, we're already having cataclysmic impact on the oil sector. I don't think it's necessary to undertake uh, direct reprisals on those facilities. Uh, EU partners, I mean, I think the EU, I, I may be the least critical of the Europeans here, um, and so maybe the question wasn't directed at me, but I think that they are vital partners in, in this diplomacy because it is the uh, one arena that Iran needs, both in terms of the, the financial connections, but also um, more broadly. They, the, the calculation was taken by Khamenei prior to the prior, the previous round of nuclear negotiations that Iran couldn't Man manage um, simply on an Asia-only economic strategy. They need a European both diplomatic and economic outlet. And so I think this, you know, wherever we begin and end on any future diplomacy with Iran, it has to include an important uh, element of, of European involvement. Um, and just on that last question about how successful Iran has been in deterring uh, reprisals, you know, I think this president makes his own calculations. I'm not sure that this is uh, the the hesitancy to engage is one that is driven by the cost that Iran has has uh, applied to any potential reprisals. I think that he uh, this is reflective of a larger political philosophy which he's been articulating since he ran for president um, about the uh, d disinclination to engage in further military uh, intervention in the Middle East. It, he, he's been very consistent on that point, um, and I think he recognizes it's even more important now as he faces a re-election battle. Norm. Uh, I will neither confirm nor deny the United States has any covert capacity whatsoever. For the record, uh, moving past that, uh, this should be an overt fight. It doesn't mean that actions can't be taken that are, are discreet that cause Iran to, to uh, understand there is there is pain. And it also doesn't mean that um, asymmetrical responses can't happen on each side. They hit us in one location, doesn't mean we have to respond back to that specific location. But this needs to be an international effort with our European partners all together. So what do I look for now from Europe? I can tell you that having sat under four administrations speaking with senior European political and security personnel from multiple countries, we rarely had a disagreement on the facts. This is not an issue of does the K d'Orsay or 10 Downing, et cetera, et cetera, the mid-level officials not see Iran in the region, missiles, et cetera, et cetera. But the way to get somewhere and what is most important, dramatic differences. And what I will point out is Federica Mogherini, and since you are here, you can do a study of this, go through the number of comments she has made on JCPOA and the number of comments she has made on Iranian missiles being fired against European citizens in Israel or Saudi Arabia or drones, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm looking for a partner that actually values, that has the same values that we do in, in terms of what's important for Iran. And, and, I'll, and I'll close by, by what's important for Iran and the re, for the United States in the region. It's aspirational. I don't care who's the king or, queen, king or queen, king, queen, or crown prince of Saudi Arabia, for example, but I'm tremendously concern, concerned about making sure that Islam is moved into a normative and moderate uh, format, that, that we have women's rights supported around the world, that extremism is fought everywhere there is a mosque, and you can't do that anywhere but from Saudi Arabia. And you need a regional economy that offers hope to broken states in the Red Sea Basin. And you can't do that from any other state except, well, Emirates and Saudi Arabia. So to me, our values are what's important in the region. It's not selling weapons. It's not oil. But it's where we want the region and the world to go and how they should be partners in helping us get there and how we need to join with them in that approach. So the question of is are some of the challenges we're having on Iran a symptom of a broader decreasing reliance on international institutions, on multilateralism and so forth, there may be an element of that, um, but I'm inclined to answer no, not really, I think. Um, you know, for sure we are, you know, experiencing a moment here where we have lots of tensions with our allies. That itself is not new. Um, you know, Jacques Chirac just passed away, and, and obviously the the – the relationship between the United States and France uh, under George W. Bush and Jacques Chirac around the Iraq War was, uh, I think you could argue, worse than the relationship between the United States and France over this question right now, for example. So these are, these are not, not necessarily new struggles. Plenty has changed, but I would say that um, the struggles that we're having right now between allies on Iran are not terribly new. 
Um, nor has this kind of overall posture of, kind of the United States, ever since 1979 really, has kind of harbored this desire for Iran to be our friend again, um, and that is, which has kind of animated policy in so many ways. And you hear it from President Trump in the same way you have heard it from other presidents. And I'm not just talking about the kind of um, outreach to the Iranian people and the idea that the Iranian people are a friend to the American people, um, which I think there's, there's truth to that. It's this idea of kind of somehow getting the Iran U.S.-Iranian alliance back together, which, you know, has been sundered now for 40 years. Um, the question of the EU, you know, I, I tend to think, um, you know, Bob Kagan wrote of Paradise and Power 16 years ago, right? And he posited these different ways that American and European, Americans and Europeans have of looking at power. And it seems to me if you were to go back and read that now, the American way of looking at power has changed um, because of our experiences since then. Uh, because of what's happened in Iraq, Afghanistan, around the world, the idea that we could use our power to sort of do the ambitious things that we wanted to do in 2003 has certainly changed. I'm not sure that Europe um, has had the same kind of evaluation of the way uh, it looks at how to use power. Um, and I think it needs to. I, I think that too much of the conversation about these issues has been dominated by what is the United States doing right or wrong, how do we look at issues and so forth, and that maybe has inhibited Europe from taking a closer look at whether its approach uh, to how it deals with problems like Iran is the right approach. Um, I would argue that Europe's approach to Iran since, say, the early 2000s, you could probably go back further than that if you wanted to, has been an unsuccessful approach for the most part. Um, Surely all my European colleagues will point to the JCPOA to me as the counter uh, example of that. But the JCPOA fell apart. Um, and I think some, and it would be easy to sort of blame that on Trump. But I think that's wrong, in fact. Every, every Republican candidate was campaigning uh, on tearing up the JCPOA. Half of the United States was against the JCPOA. Um, human rights in Iran, which has been subject of a critical dialogue between Europe and Iran, um, have not advanced despite that dialogue. Um, so I think what, what kind of EU partners would we like to see? I think the United States would like to see European partners who are more willing to deploy power um, against Iran, uh, doing things like sanctioning Hezbollah, for example, um, which is sort of one of these ongoing debates and will be a debate under the next administration uh, between the United States and Europe. Um, the question of what are, our, what are our interests in the Middle East and um, um, uh, besides, uh, besides just getting uh, – getting energy uh, imports from it is a big question. I feel like uh, maybe this should be, you know, sort of a, another policy forum. But I, would, I guess all I would argue is we do still have compelling interests in the Middle East from my perspective. I think most Americans are still very concerned, for example, about terrorism um, emanating from the likes of uh, not just ISIS but al-Qaeda, which has um, got a strong presence still in the region. Um, there's other groups in places like Idlib um, which are prospering. Um, I think we still care about the free, free flow not just of energy, which is important. Maybe. Uh, we're not getting our energy from the Middle East, but our allies in places like Asia, which is now the most important strategic theater for us, depend crucially.